welcome everybody to a new video from Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth. Today we have Sunday the 11th of February 2018 and I've come back to the table to read to you or to read with you and for you the next part of um, The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris, the book he published in 1975. We are still in section 5, that is um, uh, the eternal, what's it called there? <laughs> um, ah, I've, I forgot about that, how, how that part is called. Um, let's see, the eternal cycle, that's it, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I'm, I just lose it. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's um, the eternal cycle, yeah. And, well, Put this away here. <laughs> I don't want this anymore. Um, the eternal cycle. And uh, in chapter 4 now, we uh, have left now the uh, Jesuits in uh, Yugoslavia and, and, and all that stuff uh, during uh, before and during the Second World War. And now we are speaking about the Jesuit movement in France before and during the 1939-1945 war. Means the Second World War means part two of the 30-year war as uh, Field Marshal Fock told us already in 1919, as you know already. So I'm gonna put up uh, the picture of the secret history of the Jesuits here and then we can go and start and um, I hope we get through this few pages because I'm really looking forward not only to finish this book, this is still some 40 some pages to the end, um, but I'm also looking forward to come to the realization to teach the people about what really happened in World War II when you see it th through the eyes of uh, the author, Edmond Paris, who studied most and for all the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits, because that is completely different history from that what is taught in the church uh, in the churches in the schools where we are huh? you know in our education system because there they never tell you that any of these wars have a religious background and as i said so many times already um, it, not only since the jesuits are here but at least since they are here all the wars have a religious background and that is why we normally do not talk about religion and politics you know Let's talk about sports and economy and famous people, VIPs and all that crap instead of the real important stuff. Okay, the Jesuit movement in France before and during the 1939-1945 Second World War. We have seen how the Catholic action with Leon de Grel and his associates at the head prepared the way for Hitler in the Belgium of Christus Rex. In France, the same undermining action was going on. It started when Mussolini came to power and ended up in 1940 with the collapse of the national defense. As for Belgium, it was, so we are told, the spiritual values which had to be restored for the good of the country. The FNC, that stands for Fédération Nationale Catholique, means National Catholic Federation, was born and placed under the presidency of General de Castelnau. And I have a picture of him here. Let me just show you that. And then we get this video started with the pictures that I have prepared for you. So that you can see here, this is General Castelnau, Édouard de Castelnau. Under him was the Fédération Nationale Catholique, or the National Catholic Federation, placed as many as three million adherents joined the FNC, yeah, the Fédération Nationale Catholique. More than three million people. Yeah. The choice of its chief was clever. The general, a great military figure, of course of the First World War, and then at that time, 78 years of age, covered with his personal prestige, but of course unknown to him, an intense clerical fascist propaganda program. So even if he is not maybe agreeing with that, he is very old anyway and he is just being used to further the agenda of the Jesuits, of course. 
that the FNC, the National Catholic Federation, as the whole Catholic action was Jesuit through and through, is obvious to anyone. But we know also that the good fathers whose besetting sin is pride like to put their signature on the creations of their genius. This they did for the FNC when they consecrated this Catholic army to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, a worship set up by their company and whose basilica stands on Montmartre Hill, from where Ignatius of Loyola and his companion set off to conquer the world. As you remember, they have sworn different oaths in 1534 at the foundation of the Jesuit order in the chapel or in the church of Sacred Heart of Jesus in Montmartre. When you read something like this, Sacred Heart of Jesus and Holy Heart of Mary and all that stuff, it's always Roman Catholic. It's never ever biblical. A book concerning the FNC, whose foreword was written by R. P. Longvier, preserved for posterity the act of consecration read, quote, at the altar by the old general. We will quote just a few phrases. Therefore, I turn to the next picture here. The Fédération Nationale Catholique, the Revue Officielle. Uh, here you have a picture of uh, au Septembre, that is August-September 1931. This is a picture I found for you on the internet. Now, from this um, publication, we will quote only a few phrases. Quote, Sacred Heart of Jesus, the chiefs and representatives of Fran French Catholics prostrating themselves now before you have assembled and organized the National Catholic Federation to re-establish your reign over this land. Yeah? Jesus' reign, that's what they talk about, but not Jesus of the Bible, but the Roman Catholic Jesus. All of us, those who are present and those who are absent, have not always been irreproachable. We carry the burden of the crimes the French nation committed against you. It is then with the view to repair and, exti uh, and expiate that we present to you today our desires, intentions and anonymous resolution to re-establish over the whole of France your sacred and royal sovereignty and liberate the souls of her children from a sacrilegious teaching. We will not flinch any more before this fight for which you condescend to arm us. We want everything to be bent before and devoted to your service. Sacred Heart of Jesus, we beseech you through the Virgin Mary to receive the homage, etc., etc. End of quote. Sacred Heart of Jesus. Can you tell me where that is ever written in the Bible? That Jesus has a sacred heart in the way that it is meant here by the Roman Catholics, even to address? We beseech you, the sacred heart of Jesus, through the Virgin Mary. Where is that in the Bible? The Virgin Mary, first of all, is no virgin after giving birth to the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ anymore because she was married to Joseph and they had normal relations as any man and woman biblically married should have and do have and had had. Jesus had siblings, brothers and sisters, so she was no virgin anymore. And he addressed his mother always in the Bible as that woman. He never ever even called her mother. Huh? Look it up. This is all wrong. This is all Roman Catholic teaching. That's why it comes from the Fédération Nationale Catholique or the National Federa Catholic Federation. Sacred Heart of Jesus, we beseech you through the Virgin Mary to receive the homage. I really have to almost puke when I read things like this. As for the crimes of the French nation, the same Catholic author enumerates them. <laughs> what were the crimes of the French nation? Of course, not to submit to the ultramontane power of the Pope. 
That was the first and foremost crime of the French nation. Never to obey to the uh, ordered secular power next to the spiritual power of the Antichrist. So, the author continues here. Fatal words and general directives. Yeah? Socialism is condemned. Liberalism is condemned. Antichrist Pope Leo XIII showed that the freedom of worship is injustifiable. The Pope also showed that the freedom of speech and expression cannot be justifiably accorded. So the freedom of thought, the freedom of press, teaching and worship considered by some as rights natural to man cannot possibly be given. That's what the Pope says. Hmm? The freedom of thought, press, teaching and worship considered by some as rights natural to man cannot possibly be given. How does that sound in the ears of an American? Don't you have in your constitution the freedom of press, expression, the freedom of worship, religious freedom? Yeah? Don't you? So what do you think wh what do you say to that when you hear a Catholic because that's what the Pope is saying that those freedoms cannot be possibly given to man. Doesn't that make a Catholic the enemy of your Protestant freedoms in the United States of America? Isn't it time for you to wake up and to see the enemy who is living among you, who has infiltrated your nation from the beginning? In 1776 less than 2% of the population were Catholic and today in 2018 about 35% at least are Roman Catholic and the numbers are getting up with all the quote-unquote illegal immigrants, which is a term I don't even start to dissect and to tell you how wrong that is. But these immigrants are invaders. They are Catholic invaders and Catholics are and that is something that we understand by reading this book, I guess. Catholics are the enemies of personal freedom, the freedom of thought, the freedom of conscience, the freedom of press, the teaching and worship considered by some rights as natural to man. The Catholics are opposed to that. Oh yeah, the liberal Catholics will say that they love that, but the liberal Catholics will be killed as all the other liberals and Protestants and anybody else who stands against the Pope, because the real face of Roman Catholicism is the face of the Council of Trent. And when you, when you want to learn about the Council of Trent, I'm going to show you a very easy picture. And um, that is a book that you can get <coughs> very easily. That is the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Very easy to get that book. I have it even in my library over here. And there you can see what the Roman Catholic Church really thinks. And if you think that I am off the record here, that I am absolutely telling uh, crap, well, then go to and, and look at YouTube on that vid video of Bishop Schneider, who commented on that uh, interview that took place with Pope Francis when he was on a plane and asked what he thinks about the salvation teaching of L Martin Luther and the Pope says that he is in total agreement with that and then Bishop Schneider says well the Pope didn't speak ex cathedra we already have a standpoint in the Roman Catholic Church about what we think of Luther's salvation teaching meaning by grace you are saved yeah through faith and that not of yourselves, that not of works. That's what Luther taught. And Bishop Schneider said, we have already an infallible and ex cathedra teaching of that, the Council of Trent. So when you do not know what the Council of Trent is, uh, means what the Council of Trent was and what was decided and declared as dogma of the Roman Catholic Church in the Council of Trent, well, then you have to get this book and educate yourself. 
and not call me a Roman Catholic bigot or whatever, but this is how they do their policies right in their own, uh, in their own words. By their fruits you will know them, right? Also by their fruits you can judge them. And I judge the Roman Catholic Church on what they put in this book, the Catechism of the Council of Trent. It makes you sick when you read that, I guess. Doesn't make you sick if you're a Trentine Catholic. Doesn't make you sick when you're a Jesuit. But it makes you sick when you're a Bible-believing Christian. Okay? We must, said Pius XI, reinstate these teachings and regulations of the Church. <laughs> which, which teachings and regulations is he talking about? Well, the Council of Trent. Such is the main aim of the FNC under the hierarchy's control assured by the decentralization of the diocesan committees. In the Catholic action, as in the war, the famous word of General de Castelnau remains true. Forward. This is certainly clear and explicit. We know, then, what to expect when we read this from Antichrist Pope Pius XI. Quote, the Catholic action is the faithful's apostolate. Unquote. In a letter to Cardinal van Rooy, a Belgian, on the 15th of August. Yeah, <laughs> very well chosen date, the Assumption of Mary, 1929. Strange apostolate, consisting of the rejection of all liberties valued by civilized countries and to be the patron of, instead of, of the totalitarian gospel. Is this the right to communicate to other minds the treasures of redemption? Pius XI in Non Abbiamo Bisono. In Belgium, Leo de Grel and his friends, heroes of the Catholic action, spread around them these <coughs> spread around them these treasures of redemption, revised and updated by Father Jesuit uh, by Jesuit Father Stempfle, the discreet author of Mein Kampf. Yeah, uh, I think I spoke about that before already. The book Mein Kampf, which is attributed to Adolf Hitler, who was, by the way, only reading newspapers. He didn't even read any book. Um, certainly he could not write a book. That book, Mein Kampf, was written by Jesuit Father Stempfle, who then, a year later, after that, was done away with in the concentration camp of Dachau, by the way. It was the same in France, where lay apostles, quote, joining in the activity of the hierarchical apostolate, unquote, says Pius XI in Dixit, were busy setting up another collaboration. Huh? Again, it was the same in France, where lay apostles, joining in the activity of the hierarchical apostolate, were busy setting up another collaboration. Let us read what Franz von Papen the Pope's secret chamberlain and the Führer's right-hand man wrote concerning this subject. And here you have Franz von Papen in the picture with the Maltese cross here and here and here. Our first meeting, he says, took place in 1927 when a German delegation to which I had the honor to belong came to Paris for the Social Week of the Catholic Institute under the presidency of Monsignor Baudrillard. This was indeed a fruitful first contact, as it marked the start of a long exchange of visits between important personalities from France and Germany. On the French side, the RRPP de Latre, who is a Jesuit, de la Brière, who was a Jesuit, and Dancet, who was a Jesuit, were present at these conferences. Further on, uh, end of quote. Further on, the good apostle adds, at times, quote, this conference of Catholics reached superhuman heights of greatness. <laughs> what will that probably be? Superhuman heights of greatness. The greatness is reached its, uh, reached its zenith on the 14th of June, 1940 the day which saw the flag adorned with a swastika fly victoriously over Paris. There you have your superhuman height and greatness. 
We know that Goebbels, chief of Hitlerian propaganda, indicated that date three months before, on the 14th of March, and that the German offensive was only launched on the 10th of May. Now, doesn't that set you to think that Goebbels, uh, who was the propaganda minister of Germany, indicated the date of the 14th of June 1940 for victoriously taking over France in Paris already three months before on the 14th of March. I mean, if here your bells don't ring alarm that everything is planned on beforehand, even in war, every battle is already de decided before it took place, it seems, well, the accuracy, the author says here, of this forecast is not as astonishing as it may seem. No, because it was all planned that way. Quote, here is the secret report of Agent 654J.56 working for the German Secret Service, who sent these revelations to Himmler. Quote, Paris, 4th of July, 1939. I can declare that... In France, the situation is now in our hands. Everything is ready for J-Day, and all our agents are at their posts. Within a few weeks, the police force and military system will collapse like a pack of cards. Unquote. Many secret documents relate that the traitors had been chosen a long time before. Men like Lucaire, Bucard, Déa, Dorio, and Abel Bonar of the French Academy. This particular one fled to Spain at the liberation. That is Abel Bonar. He came back to France on the 1st of July 1958, gave himself up, but was immediately released on a temporary basis by the President of the High Court of Justice. This extremely well-documented book, which we see here uh, in the next picture of André Guerba, the book is Himmler et ses crimes, which means Himmler and his crimes. Yeah? You know Himmler, the chef of the SS. This book is out of print. It is nowhere to be found. I don't even know if the picture that I show you here is the correct picture of André Guerba. It says this name, André Guerber, but I am really not sure that I got the right picture. So my excuses for if that is a wrong picture, but you cannot even get the book Himmler et ses crimes, mean Hitler and his crimes, because it's out of print and you can find it nowhere and there is not a picture of that book found on the internet. I mean, I didn't find it during my research, but you know, for pictures I don't do hour-long research, of course, because I want to get along with the reading here. But I think it is absolutely important that we understand here that the extremely well-documented book Hitler is, uh, Himmler is a Krim of André Guerber gives details of payments allocated to these traitors by the German SR. This money was well and truly earned, for their work was very effective. Besides, the atmosphere had been prepared for a long time now to regenerate the land according to the wishes of the Catholic action, a whole brood of apprentice dictators on the model of Léon de Grel had hatched, men like Déa, Bucard, Dorio, who was, according to M. André Guerber, agent number 56BK of the German Secret Service. Now, I have another picture here, which shows Marcel Bucard, who I just named here, that is the guy you see now in the picture. Then I have here Marcel Dea, who I also named here, also one of the traitors. And of course you have Jacques Dorio, a picture from 1927. And he was, according to Gerber, agent number 56 BK of the German Secret Service. Of all this motley band, he was also the one best thought of by the archbishopric and those well disposed towards them, and, of course, by Hitler, who, later on at Sigmaringen, gave him full power. Dorio, still, who you have here in picture, was the rising star in 
Nazi-occupied France, well to be understood. Yeah? And when you are there, a star, you really yeah, <laughs> probably are collaborating with the enemy, right? And by that, betraying your own country means you are a traitor to your own people. Hmm? Doriot was the rising star, but for the immediate future and to treat cautiously the transition after the foreseen and wanted defeat, another man was needed, a highly respected military chief who would be able to dress up the disaster and present it as a national recovery. Now, we turn again to the next picture. In uh, 1936 already, Canon Cube, which is Chanoine Cube, Saint Thérèse de l'Enfant Jésus et les Crises du Temps Présent, uh, this is the book that I'm showing to you here, Saint Teresa, the Infant Jesus and the Crisis of the Present Times, wrote in 1936 already in this book, this is a quote from that book, quote, the Lord who brought forth Charlemagne and the heroes of the crusade can still raise up saviors. <laughs> As if Charlemagne and the quote-unquote heroes of the crusade were saviors. Amongst us, the quote continues, there must be men whom he has marked with his seal and who will be revealed when his time has come. Amongst us, there must be men of the cloth who are the workmen in the great national restorations. But what are the necessary conditions they need to accomplish this mission? Natural qualities of intelligence and character, also supernatural qualities, that is to say, obedience to God and his law, is just as indispensable as this political work is moral and religious before anything else. These saviors are men with generous hearts who work only for the glory of God. Unquote. Yeah, work for the glory of God, that reminds me of the Jesuit motto Ad maiorem die gloriam, for the greater glory of God. Yeah? And when we read natural qualities of intelligence and character and so on and so on, that is to say obedience to God and his law, what God? The God of the Bible or the God of this world? The Creator God and Jesus Christ and His commandments or Satan and His representative on earth, the Pope, the Antichrist and His law, His canon law? What do you think is meant here? When the disciple of Loyola expounded these political and religious thoughts, he knew who this pious quote-unquote savior would be, as his name was not a secret amongst clerics and fascists. This is told us by François Ternant, quote, A clever and persistent propaganda campaign began in favor of a Pétain dictatorship, unquote. In 1935, Gustave Herve published a pamphlet which we are going to examine. The tract is entitled Quote, unquote, we need Pétain. Its foreword is an enthusiastic apology of the Italian recovery and the even more amazing recovery of Germany. <laughs> Italian recovery from a democratic society turned over to a fascist dictatorship and Germany from the Protestant Second Reich from Bismarck from 1871 until the end of World War I to the Nazi uh, fascist uh, dictatorship of Adolf Hitler. Okay, this is how you have to understand this. This tract is titled We Need Pétain. Its foreword is an enthusiastic apology of the Italian recovery and the even more amazing recovery of Germany. I don't see an amazing recovery. I see a really going down the drain as well for Italy as well for Germany. Also an exaltation of the wonderful chiefs who were the authors of these recoveries. <laughs> now what about our own French people? There is a man around whom we could gather. We also have a providential man. Do you want to know his name? 
it is Peter. And here is his picture. Henri Philippe Pétain and Adolf Hitler. Pétain on the left, Hitler on the right. I mean, you probably knew him, and that's Pétain that we are speaking about. We need Pétain. That's him. Okay? We need Pétain, for the homeland is in a dangerous position. And not only the homeland, but Catholicism also. Quote, Christian civilization is condemned to death if a dictatorial regime is not set up in every country. <laughs> Did you understand that well? Christian civilization is condemned to death if a dictatorial regime is not set up in every country. Well, don't you see how the word Christian is here again and again abused? by Roman Catholicism? This sentence, of course, should read Catholic civilization, Roman Catholic civilization is condemned to death if a dictatorial regime is not set up in every country. Because Christians do not want to be under a dictatorial regime. Christians rule themselves in democracy and republics. And they have only one king they adhere to, and that is Jesus Christ. And no pope, and no king the pope sets before the people. Roman Catholic civilization is condemned to death if dictatorial regime is not set up in every country. That's right. Now look around in the world today in 2018. Where do we have real democratic chosen leaders who work for the country for the people of their country do we have that in germany with chancellor merkel who is there since 2005 and now even prolonging uh, into 21 uh, 2021 i think or how long this will gonna take us do you think that she is rightfully elected do you think we have rightfully elected Prime Minister here in Belgium, you have a rightfully elected Prime Minister in England, you have a rightfully elected Prime Minister and President in Italy, you have a rightfully elected President in the United States of America. I mean, just look at my video, they are laughing at you. And you see then President Candi Pre uh, Candidate President Trump and Hillary Clinton at the L. Smith dinner together with, uh, with the Archbishop of New York. Timothy Dolan, I think his name is, if I'm not mistaken. Free elections in America for a quote-unquote free president, for a quote-unquote president who works for the good of your country? Didn't you see my Hour of the Truth three-part series on Donaldus Trumpius? Well, watch that and then understand that in all the countries that I just named and all the other countries in the world too, we only have a dictatorial regime. It is not because the, on the outward, on the outside, they seem to be um, democratic. They seem to have free elections. Uh, Every politician who is in power, and I mean really in power, I mean who is a prime minister or a president or whatever, or a king, is a candidate of the Pope. And the Pope is the Antichrist. I hope that that sinks into your mind now. Christian civilization? No, 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 no. Roman Catholic civilization is condemned to death if a dictatorial regime is not set up in every country. And what do they do when they come to a country and there is not a Roman Catholic friendly regime on the hand? They call that regime change. Libya, Egypt, Iraq, Syria is going to fall, Iran is going to fall in the future. Whenever you have a regime that is working not closely together with the Antichrist, you have a regime that is not a Roman Catholic civilization, and that is condemned to death 
because there has to be installed a dictatorial regime that is set up in every country by the Pope, by the Antichrist, by Satan. This is such an important sentence. We need Pétain because Roman Catholic civilization is condemned to death if a dictatorial regime is not set up in every country. That's what this message really says. Listen. In peacetime, a regime can only be swept away by a coup d'etat if it is willing or if it has no support from the army and administrations. The operation can be a success only through a war and especially a defeat. So, the path to follow was already made clear in 1935 to re-Christianize France. No, 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 no! No, 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 no! Not to re-Christianize, to re-Catholicize France. To re-Catholicize France, the regime had to be swept away. Regime change, and the best way to attain this was to suffer a military defeat, which would place us under the German yoke. And by that, it would place you under the Roman yoke. It would place you under the yoke of the Antichrist, under the Pope in Rome. Pierre Laval, here on the picture of Time magazine cover from 1942, April 27th. In 1943, this one I just told was confirmed by Pierre Laval, the Pope's Count and President of the Vichy government. The Vichy government is the name that was given to the government that was under the occupied Germans, meaning under the yoke of Germany or under the yoke of the Pope, however you want to see that, during the occupation during the Second World War. Pierre Laval, the Pope's Count and President of the Vichy government. Do you think that this guy wasn't adhering to what the Pope said? <laughs> Do you think he would be in power of an occupied country if not? Think again. Quote, I hope Germany will be victorious. It may seem strange to hear the one who is defeated wish for the victor's victory. It is because this war is not like previous ones. It's a true war of religion. Yes, a war of religion. This is what Pierre Laval said on national radio on the 2nd of January 1943. Is that a leader of your country or is that a traitor to your country? Let's read it again. I hope Germany will be victorious. How can you be the leader of a by foreign force occupied country? and then speak for the victor and pray for the victor and hope for the victor. I hope Germany will be victorious. It may seem strange to hear the one who is defeated wish for the victor's victory. <laughs> I think so, yes. But it's because this war is not like previous ones. This is a true war of religion. Yes, a crusade, I add. Because that's what a religious war is, a crusade. End quote from Pierre Laval. This indeed was what the church wanted, even though unpleasant for the forgetful Jesuit Fessard, whom we mentioned earlier on, who doesn't want to know any more than what was said to the Ameri on the American radio for the 20 million listeners of the Christian Front by his Loyolan brother, Father Coughlin. Quote, the German war is a battle for Roman Catholicism. I cannot even say the words as they are written here because it is not true. Of course he said Christianity, but what he means is Roman Catholicism, not Christianity. The German war is a battle against Christianity and for Roman Catholicism. This is how we should read a quote like that. 
That's why it is so important sometimes not only to read these books for yourself, but maybe here and there get a little bit explanation that goes a little bit further. The Leolin bro brother, Father Coughlin, you know, the guy who was in America at that time, he said the German war is a battle for Christianity, meaning the German war is a battle against Christianity and for Roman Catholicism. But during the same period in occupied France, Cardinal Baudrillard, rector of the Catholic Institute in Paris, was saying the same thing. <laughs> now listen to him. Quote, Hitler's war is a noble enterprise undertaken for the defense of European culture. Unquote. Yeah, the European culture that we see performing today in 2018 under the European Union, which is the revived Holy Roman Empire. So, on both sides of the Atlantic, as indeed all over the world, the clerical voices were singing the praises of victorious Nazism. In France, Cardinal Suhar, Archbishop of Paris, set the example to all the episcopate by collaborating fully, and so did the Jesuit nuncio, Monsignor Valerio Valeri. After the liberation, the government asked the Vatican to recall no less than 30 bishops and archbishops who were deeply compromised. In the end, if it consented to recall three of them. So, what does that mean? What does this little sentence tell us? After the liberation, so after 1944, when the Allies landed on Britannia, in the six, uh, in, 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 in the, uh, yeah, the sixth of June, uh, six six at six o'clock in the morning, six six six. Uh, France was liberated. Then the government of France asked the Vatican to recall no less than 30 bishops and archbishops who were deeply compromised. In the end, it consented to recall three of them. What does that mean? We want to get rid of 30 bishops and archbishops because they were working for the Nazis. They are traitors to our country. And the Vatican consented to recall three of 30. <coughs> France has forgotten, wrote Maurice Nadeau. La Croix, the most dangerous mouthpiece at the service of collaboration, takes its place amongst the publications of a liberated France. You remember La Croix? Well, that Roman Catholic newspaper. I don't have repeat to repeat that again and show you the paper. Eh? We still stay with Pierre Laval here. <coughs> what did La Croix say? The prelates, who were urging the French youth to work for the victory of Germany, have not been brought to trial. The prelates, who were urging the French youth to work for the victory of Germany, have not been brought to trial. Well, the prelates who were urging the German youth to work for the Hitlerian victory have also not been brought to trial. I didn't see any Catholic clergy on the uh, Nuremberg trial, not on the bench of the accused. Did you? No, of course not, because the prelates cannot be trialed by a secular court, first and for all, and second of all, they all kept their places. They were collaborating with Nazi fascism in Germany, they were collaborating with Nazi fascism in France, they were collaborating with Nazi fascism in Croatia, in the NDH, they were doing the same in Italy, they were doing the same in Spain, and the prelates who were urging the French youth to work with the victory of Germany had not been brought to trial. Well, in no country they had been brought to trial. Not in Spain, not in Italy, not in Germany, not in France. Nowhere. One could read in Artaban on the 13th of December 1957, quote, In 1944, Lacroix was, per, uh, was prosecuted for having favored the enemy and brought before the Court of Justice in Paris. 
the case was put in the hands of Judge Raoul, who dismissed it. The affair was discussed at the chamber on the 13th of March 1946, and it was learned then that M. de Monton, Minister for Justice and thorough at purging the French press, had spoken in favor of Lacroix. In fact, the voice of pontifical thought, as Pius XII called Lacroix in 1942, was sending it his blessing, was the only one exempted from the general measures taken to suppress all the newspapers published during the occupation, even though, as Artaban reminds us, quote, Lacroix received instructions from the German Lieutenant Zahm and, in Vichy, from Pierre Laval, still here in the picture for you to see. Pierre Laval. Of course, the pontifical thought and Hitlerian instructions happily coincided. This is confirmed when we study the War Times editions of this estimable, pa estimable paper. One of the Jesuits' attributions, and not one of the least important, is to supervise all the Catholic press. In the various papers adapted to the need of their readers, they bring out, as necessary, the various shades of the pontifical thought, which, under its undulating aspects, nevertheless reaches implacably towards its aims. There is not one, quote, Christian newspaper or periodical that does not enjoy the collaboration of some Jesuits. The word discreet I left out, because that's what the Jesuits always are. If the Jesuits were not discreet, we wouldn't have to read a book called The Secret History of the Jesuits. They are secret, they are discreet, they are a secret society, they work from the behind, and what they put out in front is, oh, they are so lovely, they are so wonderful educators, and they do this for the hospitals, and this for the poor, and this and that and that. That's on the outside, and on the inside they are ravening wolves. Christian newspaper. There is not one Christian newspaper or periodical that does not enjoy the collaboration of some Jesuits. So when Jesuits are in charge of newspapers, what do you think they press? The truth or what the Jesuits want you to understand as truth? You know how Henry Kissinger said that. It is not important what is truth, it is important what is perceived to be true. That's what Henry Kissinger said, and he's right. The truth doesn't play a role for a lot of people. Only what they think is true, and that is what they have heard over and over and over again. And because they have been, her, they have been told a thousand times that the Antichrist is just one single individual that comes at the end of time, and hey, we don't have to care for it anyway because we are all being raptured out before here. That's because I can say again and again and again, the papacy is the Antichrist, like all the reformers did, even though the reformers didn't agree on a lot of things. In one point they all agreed on, without exception. The papacy of the Roman Catholic Church is, was, and always until the, retime, uh, until the return of Jesus Christ will be the Antichrist of the Bible. People don't believe the things they are told them once or twice. They rather swallow the lie that has been told for thousands of times because the Jesuits teach them through their newspapers. That's why... There is not one Christian newspaper, there is not one Catholic newspaper, there is not one liberal newspaper, there is no newspaper at all, or periodical, that does not enjoy the collaboration of some Jesuits. Why? Because of Intermirifica, because of Miranda Prosos. We spoke about that in the past. Please avail yourselves to that information. 
the fathers, these fathers, Jesuit fathers, who are all things to all men according to their oath, are of course the best at playing chameleons, yeah, when they are hidden. This they did, as we know, and after the liberation we had the surprise to see coming up everywhere fathers who had belonged to the resistance. <laughs> They joined it later than others, of course, because they only changed the sides at the end, and who testified that the Church had never, never collaborated. No, of course not. Forgotten, abolished, evaporated were the articles of La Croix and other Catholic newspapers, the episcopal mandates, the pastoral letters, the official communications from the assembly of cardinals and archbishops, the exhortations of Cardinal Baudrillard calling on French youth to don the Nazi uniform and serve in the LVF, after having taken an oath of allegiance to Hitler. All this was past and forgotten. You know, it's the same in France over here as it was in Germany. Because even though I am a German, I have to admit, after the war all of a sudden nobody wanted to have been in the party. Nobody was a, was a Nazi all of a sudden anymore. The others were always the others. Huh? All this was past and forgotten directly after the war. Denazification? Well, that's easy. I never was a Nazi. I never was in the party. All the people said that. History is a novel. A Catholic novel, of course. History is a novel. A Catholic novel, of course. And that's all your books. All your Catholic books. All your novel books. Books. They are all telling a Catholic story. History is a novel, said a disillusioned thinker. The one of our epoch, history that is, the history of our epoch, will be true to this definition. The novel is being written under our eyes. Many historians are contributing to it. Well-disposed ecclesiastics and laymen, and we can be certain that the result will be edifying. A Catholic novel, of course. That's why I highlighted in red the main part of the sentence. History is a novel. A Catholic novel, of course. The Jesuits' contribution is extensive. As worthy heirs of Father Loriquet, whose History of France gave such a fanciful picture of Napoleon. Compared to the skillful feat, it was a simple matter to camouflage the collaboration between the clerics and the German occupier from 1940 to 1944 and make it vanish. And this is still going on. Over the years, so many articles have been written in newspapers, periodicals, books, under the patronage of, uh, of the imprimatur to sing the praise of the misjudged super-patriots such as Suhard, Baudrillard, Dutois, Oviti, Dubois de la Villerable, Mayol, de Lup, etc. What a lot of pages blackened to exalt the attitude, so heroic, of the episcopate during the war years, uh, during the war years in which France experienced a situation which led the French bishops to become the defenders of the city, as a wry joker wrote. Quote, slander and slander again! There is bound to be something left, advised Basile. This perfect type of Jesuit, whitewash and whitewash again, say his successors, great writers of history novels. And this whitewashing is being carried out extensively. <laughs> that is what you are calling today history lessons in school. Whitewashing out the real, the true history that we are reading about in this by a Roman Catholic author in the beginning. He was Roman Catholic raised, Edmond Paris author. Here we learn the real history. Here is no whitewashing anymore. But all that other stuff, what we are being taught in our schools and universities and any other learning education system, is whitewashing. Being out, 
being carried out even extensively. Future generations, submerged by a torrent of exaggerations, will devote a thankful thought, at least we hope they will, to those defenders of the city, these heroes of the Roman Church and homeland, quote, dressed with the candid honesty of white linen, unquote, by the work of their apologists, some of them were even canonized. Now, let's go back to my pictures that I prepared. And there you will see the next one. Because on the 25th of August in 1944, the Jesuit Cardinal Suar, who you see here in the picture on the right, who was Archbishop of Paris since the 11th of May 1940, means... Do you remember when was the marching in of the Germans to occupy France? 14th of July, right? And since the 11th of May 1940, he already was the Archbishop of Paris. And he was the leader of the clerical collaborators. The people who were working on the same agenda as the Nazis. Imperturbably decided to celebrate the Te Deum of victory at Notre Dame. We were spared this unseemly farce only through the strong protest of the general chaplain of the FFI. We read in France Dimanche, which Dimanche stands for Sunday, so French Sunday, France Dimanche, we read in France Dimanche on the 26th of December 1948, quote, his Eminence, Cardinal Suihar, here in the picture, Archbishop of Paris, on the anniversary of his entering the priesthood, has just received an autographic letter from His Holiness, Antichrist Pope Pius XII, who congratulates him, amongst other things, for the part he played during the occupation. We know that the Cardinal's behavior during that period had been severely criticized after the liberation. When General de Gaulle arrived back in Paris in August 1944, he refused to meet the Cardinal at the Te Deum in Notre Dame. At that time, the prelate was openly accused of collaborationist tendencies. Well, that's the least you can say because he was Archbishop before the German invasion and all the time during the German invasion. If he was against it, he surely wouldn't have stayed on his post, right? The Holy Father's congratulations are then understandable. <laughs> of course they are, but there is another story of Te Deum even more edifying. After the Allies disembarked, the city of Rennes suffered much in the fighting which followed, and many died amongst the civilian population as the commanding officer of the German garrison had refused to evacuate them. When the city was taken, the city of Rennes, the traditional Te Deum was going to be celebrated, but the Archbishop and Primate of Brittany, Monsignor Rogue, absolutely refused not only to officiate himself, and this is him in the picture here, but also to allow the ceremony to take place in his cathedral. Huh? Monsignor Roque absolutely refused not only to officiate himself, but also to allow the ceremony of the Deum to take place in his cathedral. Who do you think he was? paying his allegiance to. Not the Pope of Rome, eh? To thank heaven for the liberation of his city was an intolerable scandal to the eyes of this prelate. Yes, he saw through the deception. He was not a traitor. He was not a collaborator. To thank heaven for the liberation of his city, Rennes, was an intolerable scandal to the eyes of this prelate. Monsignor Clément Emile Roque, who you see in the picture here. Such loyalty to the pontifical thought called for an equivalent reward. It came from Rome soon after in the shape of a cardinal's hat. We can blame the late Pius XII with many things, but we must admit 
that he always acknowledged his own. Unquote. Acknowledged his own. Yeah. A flattering letter to Cardinal Suard, distinguished collaborator, the Cardinal's Purple for Monsignor Roc, hero of the R German resistance. This great Pope was practicing a strict distributive justice. Of course, his entourage was of the kind which could advise him wisely. Two German Jesuits, R. P. Lieber and R. P. Hendrik, quote, his two private secretaries and his favorites, unquote, his confessor, and we are speaking about Pope Pius XII, right? Antichrist Pope Pius XII, his confessor was the German Jesuit Bea. Sister Pascalina, a German nun, supervised his household and, above all, cooked for him. Even the canary, answering to the sweet name of Dumpfaff, means Dumpfaff, Dumpfaffe, yeah, had been imported from beyond the Rhine, means from Germany, the site that was never occupied by the French. But had not the sovereign pontiff told Ribbentrop after Hitler invaded Poland? that he would always have a special affection for Germany? Was that not what the Antichrist told them? Well, in the last footnote we read here, we read in the Documentation Catholique, meaning the Catholic documentation, of the 15th of March 1959, quote, As far as the very estimable, uh, estimable, German nation is concerned, we will follow the example given to us by our predecessor, Pope Pius XII, signed by Pope John XXIII. The spirit of continuity is one of the Vatican's attributes. Yeah. This confirmed that his two private secretaries were his favorites and that they were have serving a special place for Germany in their hearts. As it was said here, he would always have a special affection for Germany. Now, this concludes the chapter. Next time we will go into the next chapter in section 5 and that is called the Gestapo and the Company of Jesus. Well, that's going to be a very interesting reading because we are reading there about Himmler and we are reading about the real Führers, the real persons in power in Germany in the Second World War. And we will learn a lot about the SS. So, for today, this was enough reading on the secret history of the Jesuits. As we saw, what happened in France was that, and I think that was the most important point that we have to keep here, that when the Germans came into Paris on the 14th of July in 1940 and had quote-unquote victory over France, that was already decided three months on beforehand. Whatever battle has been fought in the meantime was only to waste lives of men. Men who are willing to sacrifice their life in war. War is anti-biblical. Well, yes, you can call me an Anabaptist. I don't care, because the Anabaptists never go to war. I wouldn't go to war either. I wouldn't go to war in this world. I wouldn't go to war for the Antichrist. But I'm putting on the whole armor of God for the fight that he wants me to fight. Because we are not 
battling against flesh and blood, but we are fighting against principalities in high places, as we can read in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. And I just want to open that to end the reading for today. Finally, my brethren, this is what Paul says to the Ephesians. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take, you, uh, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Is there a better way to end a reading like this with the words of the Bible, with the preaching of Paul? There is no war in this carnal world being fought on a carnal way that any Christian should be a partaker of. Our war is not carnal, our war is spiritual, and that is what we have to understand. And I tell you, as long as you don't understand that, you are not truly a reborn Christian. Harsh? Yeah, but true. Thank you very much for watching listening and commenting and until next time Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth says God bless you signing off and bye bye a special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions and the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation in and, and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession, and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine of the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. Of course, both, because you can see that even the Pope and his own individual office, he meet those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican.
ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.